All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to see so many familiar faces in the audience today. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. And I'm very happy to welcome you to today's seminar, which has a bit of a tongue twister title, Realizing Rural Resilience and Inclusive Growth by Reducing Risk. Is Agricultural Insurance the Key? This seminar is actually a special joint presentation in both the Microlink seminar series and the AgriLinks Ag Sector Council seminar series. And if, if you're not aware, Microlinks and AgriLinks are sister sites, uh, sister knowledge management platforms. And they're both managed by uh, the Feed the Future Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development Project, um, who is also managing the webinar part of the seminar today. And so whether you discovered this seminar through Microlinks or AgriLinks, I highly encourage you to sign up to receive updates uh, via the other site. Whether your wheelhouse is food security and ag or inclusive market systems, there's a lot of content on both sites that's very um, of mutual interest to kind of both sectors. And so um, that's part of why we wanted to have a joint seminar today. We thought this fit both or very well into both of the seminar series and also to just um, help bring our two communities together since there's so much crossover. So uh, to move forward, I'd like to pass the microphone over to Kristen O'Klenick. Hey, thank you. Um, thanks for joining us this uh, morning for those of you here in DC and whatever time of day it is for those of you online. I know we have over 100 people joining us from around the world, so welcome to, to our virtual participants as well. Um, I'm also excited for this joint seminar. So often when we think about our programming to promote agricultural market systems, we default to that good old profit incentive. But more and more, we've learned on the ground that especially for the poor, minimizing risk can be more important to upgrading for competitiveness and for the resilience of the household. So today, we're going to focus on risk management and how an integrated approach to risk management can provide a pathway out of poverty. In particular, we'll examine the role of insurance as a piece of that overall package. So our speakers today are Richard Chollerton, who is chief of the World Food Program's Climate and Disaster Risk Reduction Programs Unit. In this role, he leads WFP's engagement on climate change and disaster risk reduction. He is also responsible for developing innovative risk management solutions targeting the most vulnerable and food insecure population. Richard is an expert on emergency preparedness, risk financing, resilience, food security, and disaster risk reduction. He also served as the Director of Humanitarian Assistance at a top 10 U.S. nonprofit and led early warning and decision support operations at the Famine Early Warning Systems Network. Lana Heron is the Senior Rural Development Advisor in the Bureau for Food Security at USAID. She has been with USAID since 2000 and has conducted numerous agricultural sector assessments and design projects to promote agricultural value chain development. She is the USAID Project Manager, project manager for the Assets and Market Access Collaborative Research Support Program, a virtual research facility which aims to improve the economic resiliency of the rural poor through policy relevant research on access to and the function of markets. That's a, hand, that's a handful, Lena. <laughs> she also manages USA's engagement with the World Bank on Agricultural Insurance Development Program and the National Agricultural Risk Assessment. So if you haven't already, for those of you in the room, please silence your phones, and we will hand it over to our speakers. Okay. Good. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone uh, here in person and uh, and online. It's uh, it's uh, really nice to to be here and uh, see uh, so many uh, familiar faces. Um, thanks for the the wonderful introduction as well. Um, I, you know, many many people know uh, the World Food Program for our humanitarian work. That's the the bulk of uh, of what we do. Uh, but a significant part of our work around the world is focused on helping uh, food insecure people uh, build resilience, reduce the risks they face, so that they can become uh, food secure. And in fact, that's uh, our uh, second point in our in our mandate and, and our mission. Um, around the world, um, and it has been for a very long time since our, our founding uh, 40, 50 years ago. And of the 100 million people a year that we support, 
uh, anywhere between 15 and 30 million people a year uh, we're helping to try and uh, address the risks that they face to, to food security um, in 50 percent of our programs and in uh, 75 percent of the countries uh, that we work in. We started working on um, insurance mechanisms uh, over 10 years ago uh, and we started doing that because we saw a potential to uh, use an instrument that provided predictable uh, response, particularly to droughts, when we were seeing uh, delays in response uh, to large-scale droughts, uh, knowing that we needed to be able to quickly mobilize uh, resources to support action early. That's led to a whole series of work uh, on sovereign risk financing with governments and safety nets, but it also led to a, a whole series of work on uh, agricultural microinsurance to try and help the populations that we ended up responding uh, to support with emergency assistance year after year uh, find a better way to manage the risks that they that they faced. Um, after uh, a few years of doing that, uh, we realized a, a couple of, of things. First, we realized that our core beneficiaries can't afford insurance. And that was a, that was a problem. We realized that you know, agricultural insurance uh, uh, could be done, especially weather index insurance, which is what we were really focused on at the time. You, you could do it. You could sell it to farmers. It could work, uh, at least at a small scale. But our farmers couldn't, couldn't afford it. Uh, so maybe it was better for someone else to do it. And we also realized that uh, insurance by itself uh, doesn't doesn't work. It has to be somehow connected with with something else. You need a, a delivery channel. Uh, it needs to be part of a broader risk management package. Um, and at a time where we um, uh, were about to close down that um, that work, uh, we learned of a small pilot project in Ethiopia being implemented by by Oxfam America called Harita, where they and their partners had been discussing with farmers, um, you know, would you, would you be able to use agricultural insurance? Here's how it works. What do you think? And a farmer uh, in, in, a, in a village in Tigray, a place called Adiha, uh, said, well, yeah, that sounds good, but I can't afford it. Can I work for it? Um, I work uh, in the productive safety net program of, of the government of Ethiopia in exchange for food and cash to help me. Um, can I work extra days in exchange for an insurance policy? And they, Oxfam uh, and their partners, REST, had said, OK, let's, uh, let's try that. Uh, first year, they insured 200 people. The next year, 1,300 people. And we said, OK, that could be something interesting for, for WFP. We, we have. 20 million people more or less every year in food and cash uh, for work or food and cash for assets programs, um, building assets, working in exchange for food and cash. And quite often they get hit by a shock um, and the gains they've made are eroded. Um, and and maybe, maybe this is a way to bring together the work on insurance and our work on risk reduction and, and safety nets. Um, and that's how the R4 rural Resilience Initiative was, was born as an equal partnership between uh, Oxfam uh, and WFP with the support of Swiss Re, uh, USA, and a number of other donors to, to test whether or not we could bring those things together and scale them up. And so what I want to do um, for the next few minutes is explain to you a little bit of what is R4 and what's, what's the approach, how do we bring these things together, uh, what does it look like. Um, where we are, and then most importantly, what, what have we learned? We've been at this now for, for almost five, uh, five years uh, in a number of countries. Um, and so I want to try and give you a sense of what, uh, what we've learned. Um, OK, so <clears throat> first, um, I said you know, we, we're bringing together a, a number of things. And, and the idea of, of R4 uh, was really to bring together um, risk reduction and safety nets and risk transfer uh, and credit and savings uh, in a more comprehensive package. So, so rather than explaining that a lot, I, I'd like to just run through um, uh, a quick kind of 
presentation of, of, of I, I guess, our attempt to show what it looks like in, 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 in real life. So, um, you know, most, most food insecure farmers, um, they uh, grow one or two crops a, a year, uh, they harvest, they have some food and income for a while. Uh, when their food and income uh, runs out, they, they have a, a deficit, um, they reduce their food consumption, uh, they become food, food insecure during the lean season, and you see seasonal food shortages. Uh, and that's a common pattern we see in, in, in many, many places. Um, and safety net programs are usually designed to deal with this seasonal, seasonal shortage uh, to help people meet their basic food needs during periods of stress predictably um, so they can uh, focus on investing in their, their livelihoods and, and, and maintaining their food security. Um, in a good year, maybe they make it, uh, but most years they, they don't. Now, when a shock hits, particularly a major drought, um, they face a much more serious problem. Um, they have less food and income, uh, a deeper food deficit, um, and that has a whole range of impacts. Uh, you pull your kids out of school, you don't repay loans, you, you don't invest in, in season inputs, uh, you reduce consumption, uh, and so on. Um, and you don't recover uh, quickly. Um, our research in Niger shows, for example, that the most food insecure households uh, after a drought take three years to recover basic consumption and stop distress coping. So it takes some, some time. Um, and with increasing climate risks, especially from, from climate change and environmental degradation and, and other things, uh, what you see is sort of a, a process of uh, destitution and livelihoods decline. And in many regions of, of the world, particularly the Horn of Africa or the Sahel, uh, we've seen that problem and pattern for, for quite, quite a while now and have been struggling to try and find a way to address, address that cycle. Um, so R4 really is designed to help turn that uh, downward trend into a, into a positive one and help people build a range of risk management um, uh, capacities um, that help them deal with those, those droughts and, and shocks. So first and, and most importantly uh, in, in R4 is we really focus on helping uh, implement good, solid uh, disaster risk reduction activities um, that reduce the impact of droughts and, and floods. And in many of the areas we work, you see high levels of environmental degradation. So even a small um, amounts of weather variability can translate into a significant shock for households. So things like soil and water conservation, irrigation systems, uh, watershed management have a major impact both on reducing the impact of the shock but also in increasing, increasing productivity. So uh, if we do that, then the shock's impact is, is less, uh, but there's still an impact. And that's where uh, insurance uh, can, can play a role. And so with, with insurance um, for, for assets or insurance for work, the households that we're working with in the safety net are given the option to work extra days uh, on more community disaster risk reduction in exchange for a drought insurance policy, which pays them if there's, there's a drought. So if there's a drought, that can bring them at least up to, uh, up to the level where they can meet their their needs, but that's not really good enough because you don't want to sort of maintain people just just above the line. The, the point uh, of resilience is so people can build thriving livelihoods and uh, and improve their lives. And so then we really try to focus on uh, helping people um, take take risk, take prudent prudent risk, um, and that could mean. Uh, access to credit, it could mean uh, diversifying livelihoods, especially diversifying livelihoods out of climate uh, sensitive sources of, of, of livelihoods so that they're not as affected by a shock and, and more uh, resilient. Um, and also so that they can build up um, savings which they can <coughs> use as a, as a buffer. Uh, insurance is expensive, uh, you don't want to use it all the time, otherwise it's prohibitively expensive. So having other mechanisms to manage uh, smaller shocks is, is important. And so the, um, the kind of model for R4 is that you keep working on risk reduction, you help people build up their own reserves, 
you put in place uh, insurance so they can protect uh, investments in their livelihoods. And next time a shock occurs, it's not as bad. They have protection uh, and they can, they can keep maintaining their, their development processes. And that, that's the idea that we have essentially tried to implement in R4 uh, in uh, four countries, uh, different contexts, um, and, um, and now uh, we have quite a lot of, um, of learning. Uh, in Ethiopia, we've been operating um, together with Oxfam now for, for five years. Um, in Senegal, we've had two full cycles with insurance, but three years of, uh, of programming. And we've just started in, in Malawi uh, and Zambia. Uh, and what's really interesting from an insurance perspective is we've had payouts, um, including the largest agricultural microinsurance payout ever in, in, in Ethiopia. Uh, in 2012, where we had uh, 12,000 households out of our 20,000 households receive about $320,000. That's $25 a head. It's 25% of the annual income of a safety net beneficiary, so that's a significant, um, significant payout. So what, what are we seeing? Uh, we just completed um, the first impact evaluation of, of, of Ethiopia, and the results are very... Uh, very interesting. Um, there's a significant difference between uh, the results we see for households with insurance and households without insurance. Uh, insured households have 123% more savings, 25% more plow oxen. Uh, they invest 25% more in agricultural labor. In one cluster of villages, they had 254% uh, more household cereal stocks. Uh, and you're seeing particularly uh, good <coughs> impacts on, on women-headed households. Uh, many uh, report that they are, have stopped sharecropping out their land and are mm -hmm. farming it themselves. Um, you're seeing increased investment uh, in, in farming uh, and better use of improved seeds and, 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 and composting for, for those households. Um, you're seeing um, when you... Um, when you, you talk to people that they're more willing to take risk uh, because they feel protected. Uh, they're happy to pay insurance premiums, especially in labor, because they get something else out of it, an asset, you know, like an irrigation uh, canal or an or a improved terrace. Um, uh, and they see that it's, um, that it's working. Um, in Senegal, uh, we're now on, on the third year of insurance. We're starting to, to scale up. And I wanted to just talk about lessons in, in three areas, and then I'll, I'll pass over to, to, to Lena. Uh, what are we learning on insurance? What are we learning on gender? Uh, and what are we learning on financial uh, access? So on, on insurance, uh, we're learning that it's, it's hard. Insurance is a hard business especially in the places where we're talking about. And one of the hardest things is to really help foster uh, a sustainable market where local insurers uh, are willing to develop products, offer products, um, and, and, and really build, build a private sector infrastructure rather than relying on, uh, on us to provide the, those things. And one of the key things that we're seeing in Senegal uh, is um, trying to um, develop distribution channels for multiple products uh, increases the interest of local insurers in, in the market. If they know that they can sell crop, livestock, uh, asset, uh, other kinds of insurance to, to those, those communities, then they see a more viable business model than just a single product in a, in a single place. And so, for example, we... Uh, have been working to link uh, our crop um, insurance um, distribution uh, with the sale of livestock insurance commercially to farmers uh, in the same areas so they have, they have access to that as well. Mm -hmm. So helping to expand the network and, and, and crowd in more, more products. Mm -hmm. Uh, especially with index insurance, both in Senegal and Ethiopia, one thing that has been really, really important is the index design process itself. 
and a process of continuous improvement. Um, it's not easy, but you can go to a community, you can look at uh, crop yield data, you can look at weather data, you can come up with an index, you can write a product. Um, but what we've tried to do is um, have a community-based design process um, where the, the product itself is really tailored to the specific livelihoods and cropping uh, strategies of the farmers we're, we're targeting. So, you know, if you plant a long cycle crop, but then there's a late start to the season uh, and you switch to a short cycle crop, uh, we tried to design the product with farmers so that it covers the early window so they can replant if it fails um, and cover the late window in case they have a total crop failure. So you can, you can integrate the product into their, their actual farming practices. <clears throat> um, but even when you do that, every year it's important to go back and validate. Did it work? How do you adjust it? Um, to keep fine-tuning it um, because there's lots of room for, for error. Uh, in there, uh, and we just don't know yet how to um, how to get it right the first time. I'm not sure if we will. Delivery channels are key. This is a common uh, common thing we keep saying over and over again in 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 in, in our discussions about uh, insurance. Uh, you can have the product, but if you don't have a way to get it to people, you don't have a sustainable delivery channel. Um, that's a major constraint. So in Ethiopia, we've used the Productive Safety Net program as the distribution channel. So you have a large infrastructure in place. It's regular. It's sustained. Uh, helps you with targeting, distribution of payouts, collection of premiums, and, and so on. Uh, in Senegal, we've used WFP's program in country, but that's not quite as, as stable. Uh, and at some point, uh, we hope that um, <clears throat> that's replaced by a government. Uh, productive safety net, and the government of Senegal is focused on, on that at the moment, but it's not there yet. So, so that's uh, how we think about building the distribution channels and integrating is, is really important. Um, we're also finding that farmers um, understand the importance of the integrated approach, that you need risk reduction, that you need risk transfer, that you need better access to credit and, and inputs and, and so on. Um, and so that's, that's, um, that's reassuring that we haven't just cooked up a nice uh, a nice diagram and tried to implement it, and nobody understands it. People really think uh, seem to uh, to appreciate that. Um, on gender, we're seeing quite a lot of um, uh, interesting things uh, on on gender. Uh, we've seen increased access to land, seeds, and water for irrigation and drinking. Um, that has uh, an impact on the amount of time, especially women. Uh, and girls spend uh, collecting uh, water, uh, and that gives them more time for, for other things. Um, in Senegal, we have a major component on, on savings groups. We have, um, uh, as a core part of the, the program, uh, women's and men's savings groups. And so that's resulted in better numeracy, literacy, and business skills for, for women. Um, and in general, we're seeing uh, more confidence from women on their ability to uh, meet their basic needs, care for their, their children, pay school fees, and, and, and so on. Uh, in Ethiopia, one of the main things that families use payouts for is paying school fees. Um, so that's, that's an interesting uh, finding as well. Um, on financial access, um, our risk reserve, our savings uh, um, component, and our prudent risk taking, our, our credit livelihood diversification uh, component, uh, see a lot of demand. So we see, even though there's quite, um, quite a lot of microfinance uh, institutions operating in Senegal, uh, we see a huge demand, especially for informal uh, financial services, and once you you have informal savings groups established, you see a lot of demand for connection to formal uh, microfinance uh, services. Um, <clears throat> uh, we see uh, really the importance of good quality um, training uh, so that people's financial literacy is improved, um, and that not only helps with the savings and, and, and credit access, it also helps with the insurance and fitting fitting those pieces of the puzzle. Um, together. 
Um, we see also the savings uh, being used really as a vehicle for investment for risk taking uh, itself, which is, is what we, we hope for. So people are using it, especially men, to buy ag inputs uh, and then particularly women for investment in petty trade uh, activities. Um, okay, I'll stop there. There's so much more to talk about, but I hope we can uh, get into to some of the issues during, uh, during questions and, and I'll pass over to... Elena. Thanks very much. Thank you. That was really nice. It was such a nice presentation. Thank you, Richard. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I think we're going to do questions and discussion at the end, so I'll just I'll just go along. Um, I'm Lena Heron from VFS, the Bureau of Food Security at USAID. Um, when I I, when I first heard uh, about the R4, I got into a discussion about the R4 uh, model uh, with people. I, it was like 10, 10, 12 years ago, 10 years ago anyway, I think. Huh? A few less? I've been working on, on this topic for about 10 to 12 years now, uh, uh, coming into it from, a, from an agricultural development, value chain development uh, angle and trying to figure out how to make finance work for ag development and, and work on and poverty in that context. And I, I remember the, the first time I met with some of the folks on R4, and I felt like I had met my people. I felt like I, you know, what, what they were saying about the integration of risk reduction and uh, risk transfer along with um, the risk, you know, improving people's ability to, to manage their own risk, to cope through savings, and then prudent risk taking, it, it resonated with me. I realized I had been talking about that very, that very thing. So when we, this, this is my objective, I, I should say, the portfolio that I work on in the Bureau of Food Security, um, I work a lot on insurance and trying to, trying to make specifically indexed insurance uh, products available and effective instruments, tools that we can use in our agricultural development uh, programming. Why indexed insurance particularly? I mean, I, I think many people have, have heard a lot of presentations on indexed insurance. Um, we need lots of different kinds of insurance and other kinds of risk management tools. I work particularly on indexed insurance because it's one of the harder ones to make work uh, because of the capacity needs uh, in, in uh, host countries. Um, but really we need a wide range of mechanisms. But we, we need them as tools uh, for the kinds of things they can add uh, to, our, to our programming. Specifically, we're looking at it within the Feed the Future um, kind of strategic framework. You know, we're looking at it both on the what it can do for ag sector uh, growth, but also on resilience. And I think uh, Richard just spoke very um, compellingly about those kinds of things and the, and the kinds of things they're seeing in their programming. We're looking at it in terms of what it can do to increase access to finance, uh, what it can do in terms of increasing technology adoption, and people's just own incentive to invest in their own, in their own production. On the resilience side, Again, Richard gave us some examples, and I'll give, I'll give some others uh, uh, that we're seeing in terms of some of the um, work that we're doing. But looking at uh, changing the coping strategies that people are using, and we're really seeing improvements in the types of coping strategies in terms of people consuming, like not consuming less meals, right? So not using that kind of potentially very negative coping strategy of cutting back on meals. Um, also, it just, I mean, the fact that you can change the response time and so that people don't deplete their assets uh, is a really important thing because once people deplete assets, it's very hard to climb back out. And that's, I think your, I love your graphics on that. I mean, that, that, you know, downward spiral, it's very hard for people to climb back out of that poverty trap once they start falling in. We're also seeing shifts in people's aspirations, whether people, you know, once you fall down into that, that poverty trap, not only is it hard, it's hard to climb out, it's hard to even imagine climbing out for a lot of the people that we work with. And I think that can be devastating. So shifting those aspirations. 
we're seeing the similar kinds of findings that the R4 people are producing. Very consistent, right? That when, on the investment side, this is on the ag growth side, that when you take some of that risk out of the system, we're also finding anywhere between 20 to 30 percent you know, improvements in, say, adoption of technologies uh, and uh, use of improved seeds or fertilizer or, or labor. Um, we're seeing that, we saw that in Mali uh, with the project Ghana, similar kinds of findings. Uh, in Kenya, the livestock insurance product there uh, led to people investing more in the quality of animals in, within their herds, so improving veterinary services for the, their herds. Um, and resulting in higher uh, incomes from milk sales. On the coping side, similar, you know, again, this is the, these are examples of the, the kind of findings. I think they're very consistent with uh, the kind of stuff they're seeing in R4, that people are 25% less likely to reduce the number of meals consumed per day after, you know, with, in the face of a drought. 25%, that's pretty significant. And it was, and it was much higher for poorer households. 43% less likely to cut back a little bit on the, on the, or a lot on the food that they're eating a day. And, and why is that important? I mean, the people who work on humanitarian assistance know, you know, mom and dad cutting back on a meal, you know, that's, maybe they can, they can withstand that. Where this becomes incredibly important is for kids, right? That when kids are, are, are cutting back consistently on meals, uh, you know, you're, you're basically transferring that shock into the next generation because that has cognitive impact uh, uh, and, and other <coughs> kinds of developmental impacts, right? We're also, this is the asset part of it, we're less likely to see people sell off their assets in the face of some crisis, right? So less likely to see distress sales of animals or other kinds of assets. And again, that's the poverty trap that's, you know, these are both kind of poverty traps that are very hard to climb back out of. So BFS has an a increasingly broad portfolio to try to um, expand access to these kinds of tools and improve the quality of these tools. We started with um, mostly an R&D kind of uh, project. The, it was mentioned this, this collaborative research support program that I manage. Um, I've been <clears throat> for almost 10, 12 years now putting, uh, you know, directing funds towards doing research on these kinds of activities. And that's where those, some of those um, uh, numbers came from, uh, just different activities. We've had probably a dozen uh, pilots in different activities in as many countries or, or nearly uh, as many countries over the last uh, dozen years. Um, as Richard said, this is hard stuff to do. This stuff is not easy. Uh, and especially at this retail level where we're working, um, it's very, it, it, it's, it's hard. And it, there, there's a need for tremendous capacity building work on every angle. It's kind of like the early days of, of microfinance, right? How do you, you know, figuring out how to make it work. Um, and we're still, we're still learning a lot. But that's what that insurance uh, initiative Index Insurance Initiative is mostly an R&D effort to try to build the evidence and, and build the know-how um, and contribute. We've also started something called the Global Action Network on Index Insurance, and we you know, pull in these folks, the academics involved in this group, but also people like the R4, uh, private sector, multilaterals, people like the, the IFC, the, the Global Index Insurance Fund over at the IFC are all part of this kind of network that we're trying to come together at that global level to figure out what are the constraints to really developing this stuff as an effective tool for development professionals and private sector to use in these developing country contexts. So that's what that one's about. I'm going to talk a few more, uh, <clears throat> next couple of slides, a little bit more detail about these two things just to show you an example. Um, but there, this is a scaling effort uh, by the bank that USAID's uh, supporting, and then a, an example of uh, kind of a research-linked uh, scaling activity that I want to talk about with the climate resistant maize. Uh, but I want to point out, <clears throat> excuse me, this African risk capacity as well. Uh, we're starting to engage with another part of what was originally a WFP uh, activity, African Union now, uh, to develop a sovereign risk management 
facility that uses indexed insurance. And so one of the things I want to point out about that is that you know, these <clears throat> insurance and risk management is something that operates at many levels, right? We are, R4 and a lot of the work that, that I'm doing with I4, which is kind of a joke among us that we have these, there are many letters left with four that you could get involved with. Um, but uh, work on this retail level, right? Work at the kind of insurance for households, farmers, producers, and so on. But these, these products can be used at the meso level for portfolio, for value chain uh, actors, financial portfolios of, of MFIs and, and banks. Um, uh, they they are ob obviously can be used at the more sovereign level uh, for sovereign risk uh, at the macro level and, and so on. So, <clears throat> and we need to, again, develop more mechanisms and more of an understanding at this country level how to use these mechanisms. Just a little bit of detail on, on a couple of these activities. This is a, a, a newer activity for USAID to get involved with, with the World Bank as the partner on this. It's really about developing public-private partnerships at the country level where the public is not, um, the public is not, I just realized I had gotten tethered with your tape, uh, Adam, that the public is not donors, but the public is the, the country partnering with its private sector to utilize market-mediated instruments to manage risk, right? And so in, in some cases, it may be uh, using insurance as part of its safety net, right, for its, for its resilient, to meet its resilience objectives. Uh, in other cases, it may be that it, instead of handing out seed and fertilizer, it backs off a little bit and, and maybe partially subsidizes an insurance program, which changes the, changes the, the risk structure that, that producers are facing so that they're more likely to buy and invest in fertilizer and seed, right? So it's looking at the options for, for achieving both resilience and agricultural growth objectives with these more market-mediated tools. Um, so in, in, we're not doing this everywhere. Right? I mean, this, this, this stuff is not ready for prime time everywhere, but in a few key countries, we're, it's really moving forward. So in Kenya, for example, the government has put about a million and a half dollars this year into um, rolling out a livestock, both livestock and crop insurance. Um, they, so, so that's for just this year, but they're also in negotiations uh, to put a program together uh, over the next five years to continue rolling this out. Private sector will be implementing that, right? This is a, a partnership between the government and the private sector. And one of the things I loved that Richard mentioned, and I want to underscore, is that there's huge complementarities between insurance where it's used, you know, and, and kind of subsidized by the, the public sector and the development of the commercial market. There's huge complementarities there. Um, Bangladesh is another country where this program is working. I, you know, I think the, you know, a, a statistic like that, that every year on average, right, that if you take all of the up years and down years, that on average, this a country like Bangladesh loses 2.4% of its, of its ag GDP, I think that specifically refers to, to crises, right? So that means uh, in a bad year, it could be like 10%. Right or or something. That's a that's a big hit for a country to take, and so you get countries like Bangladesh, you know, that really need to do something about that risk exposure because it's dragging them down anyway, and they're paying for it anyway, right? And I think that's where you get governments understanding that they have an incentive to figure out how to manage this risk, both at the sovereign level and have their country, you know, the people in their country better managing that risk. So. AIDP is focusing on that as well. Um, climate resilient maize is a is a new activity that we're putting in place again under this kind of R and D shop. Um, uh, we've mobilized some the um, researchers that I work with from U.S. universities uh, and host country institutions to partner with CIMIT, uh, who are, develop these drought resistant maize varieties. They're 
they're both working with private sector that you know the idea is to get these seeds out in and used in the commercial market right we believe that insurance will improve that uptake okay and so we we're building a component into this effort to to really scale out the um, availability and uptake of those seeds. We're building in a component that will develop an insurance product that's optimized for those seeds. And what I love about that is that <clears throat> if you think about drought resistant varieties of any, of any crop, right, so maize in this case, that the drought resistant varieties take care of, you know, the moderate, moderate drought, right? That's, I mean, the drought, uh, the, the, the seed guys will tell you, they don't take care of the severe drought. They don't take care of the really, you know, deep hit. And so people still are hesitant to adopt them. They, they like the idea of having the moderate drought protection, but unless they can get the more severe protection as well, they're still hesitant to adopt those varieties because they have to take a loan for them, right? And so this activity is trying to combine the complementarity of improved seed to handle the moderate drought with an insurance product that kicks up just the tail end severe drought and, and puts those together. It makes the seed more attractive. It makes the insurance a little bit cheaper because you don't worry about the moderate drought with the insurance. And so the whole package together is a lot more attractive to the farmers. We're doing this in Mozambique and, and Tanzania. We're just starting that up. So stay tuned for this because we're going to probably uh, bring back a presentation I don't know next year or, or the year after on on what happens with that. Do, you know, has it worked out the way that we we believe it will based on other kinds of uh, findings? Because of all of the the R, the I four activities are with uh, researchers, we we build really rigorous impact evaluation into this. So we'll have we'll have good um, solid. And and I think what's interesting about the impact evaluation is it's not just on the Productivity and incomes, but the kinds of stuff that that R4 uh, data was looking at as well: women's empowerment within the household and, and the gendered aspects, whether it changes people's uh, eating patterns and and their the fact that they're sending their kids to school and such as well. Um, just a few last words. I was just out in Senegal. I had the pleasure of uh, traveling with Richard's colleagues um, to and and Andre. Um, Nashant from E3 to visit the R4 site and um, and also attend a uh, insurance day workshop that the mission hosted out there. You know, a lot of our work uh, at, in view of food security, we have our own portfolio of activities, but we're increasingly working with missions who are integrating this stuff into programming in very exciting ways. Both of the mission's activities, you know, their, their flagship value chain activity and their um, resilience, kind of more resilience oriented activity, um, both of those uh, agricultural development activities integrate insurance into their programming. Um, they're not doing the insurance, they're tapping into insurance that is, that is taking place within the country more broadly. Uh, but they're but they're working to to support and develop and enhance and utilize and and integrate it into programming in in a way that I think is is really a model for uh, other countries to look at. Um, I was really impressed by the strength of the agricultural for development I kind of call it community out in Senegal um, and with with the government in the lead the, um, or not the government but the the government has a, a uh, it's an ag, the ag insurance company out in Senegal is, is a co-owned government private sector partnership. And what was really interesting about the, this insurance day was the fact that, you know, yes, the projects that are utilizing this were there, but so were the insurance companies, both the, the PPP insurance company on ag insurance and the member member insurance companies that are part of that, and the government. The thing was opened by uh, the secretary direct, director from the mini, um, minister of ag and the mission director. Um, so high level interest. 
um, 60 government, private sector, NGO, and program reps were all there and very engaged, very excited to kind of identify what are the constraints to really working with this, where, what are the opportunities. We had a really compelling presentation by one of the very dynamic um, leaders of a farmer's organization who talked about how important it is for her members to be able to use these tools. I think in a way that's, you know, I feel like I, I'm so passionate about this stuff that it's so exciting for me and so and so refreshing for me to to just be able to sit back and listen to somebody in the field like that talk about about why this stuff matters to her, right? So very exciting there. I think that's all I had to say. Oh no, of course not. What what presentation would be able would be complete without saying, again, this stuff is hard and and it can be done poorly. I always try to say that at these presentations. I'm such a cheerleader for insurance, and yet I am also the first person to say, oh my gosh, you can really screw this up. You really can. Right? Yeah. Richard, <laughs> Richard I also made this argument for we have, to pay, it, it, we have to pay attention to how this stuff is designed. It is our job as development professionals to make sure that the development elements of this are still maintained, right? We can't do it without the private sector. The private sector is not the ones, you know, not the ones that are necessarily going to do make sure that it has a development impact. And so making sure that the, the quality of the contracts that are used have a lot of client value, very important. Um, Richard talked about these same things. Outreach and education. We need informed consumers. People, this stuff is, insurance is expensive. And it's not always the best way to manage the risk. People need to understand what they're purchasing. Otherwise, you have, you know, it's a it can be a disaster, right? Um, the importance of integrating it into other dis for distribution channels and other efforts, as I think R4 is a great example of. And then finally, and a big part of what we're working on in this AIDP is helping the public sector understand what a good role for the public sector is. Because these things will, it, this tool will not become available unless you have a concerted effort between the private sector and the public sector, I am convinced. And donors, all of us working together in a concerted way. And so it's really important that the public sector understand what the right role is. I mean, that's a, that's a familiar story, right? We in development are familiar with that that's, you know, the, the public sector has an important role to play, but it can, it can really, it needs to figure out what that role is, and we can help in that way. That's what I have. I think that's it. Thank you. All right. Should I, should I, should I turn this off so it doesn't fly? All so right. So you know? we want to thank Lena and, um, and Richard for a great presentation today. Um, we're going to go ahead and move into the Q&A portion of our, um, our seminar. Um, just so everyone knows, there, there are about 100 people um, online, and we have about 40 here in the room. So there's a lot of questions, I'm sure, coming in. Um, we'll, we'll, take, we'll start with one question in the room and then switch to the webinar. And for anyone who has to leave early, the presentation was recorded, um, and we will be sending out a, um, an email within the next week with the link to that recording and the presentation slides and some additional resources. So we'll start with here in the room. I'm going to ask that you say your name and your organization, OK? Hi, I'm Tom Shaw from CRS. I have two questions, one for each of you. Uh, for Lena, are you aware of the microinsurance venture incubator that was launched in January? And whether you would be interested in learning more about it. It brings together a lot of the players to get the back end side right for all of this. And to Richard, my question to you is, do you actually have a curriculum around the finance education dealing specifically with the crop insurance that you're delivering now? And if so, is it available? Um, Richard and I were, were laughing <laughs> or musing or whatever about the the um, proliferation of platforms and whatnot to on this topic. Um, we, I mean, we often try to attend these these meetings and be involved in these things, and it's it, it's becoming somewhat burdensome. 
So no, I don't know about the microinsurance incubator. If you have information, please send it on. Um, there are increasing numbers of platforms and, and fora and whatever, and we're, we are working to try to coordinate some of the major ones. Um, and so it would be good to, uh, yeah, let me just leave it there. Please, please forward that on. Um. Yeah, we, we've um, got different uh, approaches in, in different countries. Uh, happy to share what we what we have. Just if you give me your, your email, Tom, afterwards, then um, then then we can. Um, maybe, maybe just to add to to, to Leno's comment, you, it, there's, there's been an explosion of interest on on um, microinsurance, especially agricultural microinsurance, uh, recently, um, and there's been a a big focus on, on global level coordination and, and learning. And I think that's important. But there's a couple of things that I think that are, that are really key for us as a community to, to, to focus on. Um, the first is uh, there's enough experience that's been generated over the last 10, 15 years on agricultural microinsurance, especially on, on, on an index insurance, um, that we don't need to go and pilot it to see if it can be done. It can be done. What we really need to do is focus on uh, innovation around the roadblocks to scale. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so for example, we're doing a lot of work on trying to test uh, remote sensing technologies uh, for index insurance uh, because there's not uh, enough rainfall stations out there. In any case, rainfall stations have their their problems. That that that's nothing in this is easy. That's not easy too. But but there's there's an example of a of a block. And um, the other thing I think we really need to somehow get our, our heads a, around um, is we got we have to focus constantly on pathways to scale. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's great to innovate. It's great to pilot as long as there's a clear pathway to to scale. And if there isn't, we shouldn't we shouldn't be doing it. Um, and scale takes time and patience. Um, it's not a five-year project. It's not a one-year project, so certainly. Um, our friends at Swiss Re um, once told me that it took Switzerland, that's a fairly sophisticated insurance market <laughs> with quite a bit of capacity, 18 years, 18, one eight years, to put in place hail cover for farmers. So if it takes the Swiss 18 years to put in place a single product, I think we have to have a vision of how we um, how we test and develop products, how we innovate, and how we scale up that has a similar kind of view over the long term to build a market in places that don't have the infrastructure and capacity um, already, and that's that's difficult. So, I mean, to give you a, a, a practical example, um, we've spent the last four years in Senegal trying to get it right. Uh, we have a five-year project in Senegal. So, <laughs> so this is our last year, and we've just started to crack the code. But there's so much more work that we need to do on the technical side, on the operational side, uh, on the policy and regulatory side, on the infrastructure side, to, to get to the point where instead of uh, 1,000 farmers in Senegal or, or, or 30,000 that we'll have in Ethiopia, which is a big number, but it's not an uh, insurance market big. An insurance market big is a million farmers. Uh, so to get from from here to to there, we've got to to really focus on 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 how how to do that. And I should say, R four is not alone in that. For every no 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 for every all. one of these yeah. things, it would, you know, every example, it's it takes yeah. more years than you'd imagine to, to actually get it off the ground. So um, we had a quite quite an active conversation online, and I'd like to thank Fabio next to me for entertaining a many slew of questions that came our way. And we did have over 140 people online, and so I'm going to pick um, a couple of questions that went together. This first one comes from Thomas Buck of um, SSG Advisors in Burlington, Burlington um, Vermont. He asks, um, you're not mentioning the importance of consistent and effective regional climate data. Does R4 focus on improving climate data or working with partners who are? And similarly, Rod of BRAC USA asks, what? can you address whether there is a list of countries that are insurance ready based on the availability of weather data? OK. Um, so two, two questions. Are, are we using regional and consistent weather data and improving them? Um, 
and then is there a list of, of um, data-ready countries? I think the list of data-ready countries would be very, very small, mm. possibly zero. <laughs> um, yeah, so we do, a, we do a, few, a few things. First of all, in the initial design process, we do a lot of work um, looking at the relationship between um, current climate risk, uh, trends in climatology and climate change projections, and food security to determine what areas uh, this kind of approach are most uh, needed and likely to, to work in. Um, and there, if necessary, we do some work on improving uh, climatology. So in, in Senegal, we've had a big, uh, a big effort to improve their basic rainfall uh, gridded data set. Uh, are there any technical questions? We could talk about them afterwards. Um, and that's a prerequisite, in, in, in essence, for, for doing, uh, doing insurance. Um, and then we, at the local level, uh, combine station data uh, with, uh, with remote sensing. Um, and if there is no station data, at least in the early, um, the early components of the project, then we, we install an automatic weather station so we can really start to calibrate the, um, the products. One of the things that's been really interesting in Ethiopia is working with uh, Columbia University's International Research Institute for Climate and Society, the IRI, um, we've been able to um, take places that have no rainfall station data and combine limited station data uh, with remotely sensed data to reconstruct climatology so that we can start to understand the, the risk. Because otherwise, otherwise you can't construct an, an index correlating uh, precipitation or something else with, uh, with loss. Can I add something to that? Because the, the last word there was key. So <clears throat> I think it's important to uh, underscore the, that it's not just climate data. It's not just rainfall data. It's not just, it, it's, you also need really good loss data. If you're going to price these products and design these products, you need to map the, if you're using a, a climate or weather index, you need to map it to the losses you're trying to, protect against. When we talk about design for impact, you really need to make sure that these things closely correlate to the loss you're trying to protect against. And so you need good loss data. And that's a, and, and some of the <clears throat> some of the best products and what I think what the what the community is trying to move towards in many ways are in many places area yield products will be will provide much better cover for people. But you can't do area yield products without loss data. And it'll be years before you have the kind of loss data that, that you can effectively price against. So yes, actually, you know, we need to incentivize better data collection. And when we think about this long, for the long haul kind of development agenda that Richard's talking about, anything we put in place needs to think about how it incentivizes better data collection for the long range. Because that's the only way we're going to bring the price down on these on these insurance products. Yeah. I, are we calling on people? No. no. Miguel Robles from E3. Uh, uh, thanks for the great presentations. A um, couple of questions for uh, Richard. What, what's your experience in the R4 uh, project, working directly with insurance companies, reinsurance companies, and if you already have experience on what, what fraction of the final premium is really paid by the farmers or, or the final client? And um, that's one. So, so to give us an idea of how much um, subsidies are needed, are, are we talking about we need to subsidize, what, 50% of the, pre the final premium, 90%, 10%? So, so that's, that's, I think that's a, that's a key question to, to start gathering learning on that. And the second question um, is about um, once you, I don't know if, if you had the experience working with reinsurers. Once you work with the reinsurers, how expensive the products, you know, uh, become. Especially, if want to, I don't want to get too technical here, no, but yeah. if we, you know, take the actual fair price, how, how, you know, much above the actual fair price we have to go 
you know, I'm, I'm thinking, and, and this is related yeah. to Elena in terms of the scaling up. Scale up, you know, really at a larger scale, where we, we will have to work with insurance companies and reinsurance companies because the risk capital is going to be yeah. it's going to be huge. You're asking yeah. about the loading, like what's a reasonable exactly. loading to expect? Okay, I'm and I'm happy. That's a good question from Martin too. Um, so, um, okay, uh, first working with the companies and then the pricing. Uh, those are <laughs> separate questions. Um, I mean, working <clears throat> working with local insurance companies is 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 a variable experience. Um, in the sense that in some places you have specialized agricultural insurance companies, take, take Senegal, there's a, there's a state uh, insurance company, Canas, uh, that Lena, Lena mentioned. Um, and so ag insurance is their business. Um, they don't have the specialized capacity in, in index insurance, uh, so we're working uh, with them to, to build that capacity to develop products. Um, and the government of Senegal subsidizes 50% of agricultural insurance premiums across across the board in, in Senegal um, and so that's a, I mean that's a key policy issue for the government of Senegal the the effective use of that of that subsidy um, in Ethiopia uh, there are private sector uh, insurance companies um, and you'll find this this is quite common in, in, in many countries is that uh, there's an urban market for property life and casualty insurance that local insurers have a small book um, and that they uh, are not able to carry the risk of a large covariate hazard like drought. So in other words, if I crash my car today and you're paying premiums and don't crash your car, the premiums can pay the payouts and you're going to have a, a sustainable insurance business. Uh, if all 100,000 of your farmers uh, are affected by a drought at the same time, you have to pay all of them on the same, the same day. And that requires you to have a lot more money on, on hand. So for them, OK, first they need reinsurance. Um, they don't have the technical capacity. Uh, and although they may be interested in the business uh, in the long run, it's a, it's a harder sell for, for them. Um, and so we spend a lot of time working with them on index design and capacity development. And, and, and in a sense, it's a, it's a classic first mover problem. Until the market's big enough for them to really take it on, they're not going to take it on. Uh, and the only way the market will get big enough is if we uh, help push it there. But we want to, the private sector to push it there. And so, um, so that, that we've got to find the right, the right synergy there. Uh, reinsurers, well, now more uh, reinsurers are interested in this, this market. They see it growing. They see potential. Um, Asia is a big micro-insurance market because of government subsidies, but Africa's not. But, it, but it's growing. Um, so for example, Swiss Re does about 50 agricultural micro-insurance transactions uh, a year on the continent, uh, and they're, they're probably the, the biggest. Um, in our experience, for example, with Swiss Re, who at the moment reinsures uh, all of our projects, we get wholesale pricing from the reinsurer. So there's no load. There's no load from the reinsurer. Uh, there is an uncertainty load in the calculation of the uh, risk based on poor data, climate change, and other factors. So even if we do our very best to take all the data, uh, come up with an actuarially fair price, uh, because of the quality of the data and the uncertainty around it, uh, there's, a, there's an uncertainty load. And that's no different from us uh, as, a, as a major uh, commercially viable insurance program that has uh, less than perfect data. So that's, that's there. You do also see loading at the national level where the local insurers um, load. Uh, and that's fair, uh, but actually we do we do most of the the work. So we we do the the index design, we do the data collection, we do the marketing. Uh, so there's a there's a question about what's the what's the appropriate load for a local insurer, um, reflecting the fact that they're essentially writing paper, uh, but also with the idea that you want them to get into the business as well and not just write your paper. So that's, um, that's a, a dynamic there. The right level of subsidies, that's a very difficult question. You know, agricultural insurance in the developed world is 80% subsidized. 
Um, that's a government policy um, decision. In Ethiopia, uh, the price of the insurance is 100% uh, commercially paid uh, by, the, by the household, either in labor or in cash. 10 to 20% of the farmers who buy insurance in Ethiopia in, in R4 are cash-paying farmers who pay the full price. And it's expensive. Uh, the community design process um, uh, has meant that we have products that pay out, let's say, every five years. Uh, there's two. There's two options. One's a four and five, and one's a five, five and six payout. That's very frequent for an ag insurance product. Normally, you'd expect no more frequent than seven years, maybe ten, or, or, or would be a would be an appropriate pricing level. So, so that's expensive. You know, they pay seventeen to twenty dollars on a hundred dollars of cover. Um, but um, that's what the farmers ask for. And they ask for it for a couple of reasons, we think. Uh, one is because they have limited other ways of managing their risk, and the value to them of the protection goes way beyond the straight actuarially fair price. It's about um, access to credit and being able to repay your loan. Uh, it's about being able to keep your kids in school. It's about knowing that you can buy seeds and fertilizer without losing your um, investment, um, and so that's a, that's a really interesting dynamic we see in Ethiopia. The second reason is, is also that they can pay in in labor, and so they don't they don't just get um, the insurance policy; they get the asset that they build with with the the labor input. So they get a double you know a double benefit. And and for us as the uh, as the institution with our donors paying those, those premiums, we get the double benefit. We get the asset. Um, and for us, we're doing a cost-benefit analysis, but you know, this year we pay like 350,000 in premiums in Ethiopia for about 1.5 to $2 million worth of uh, uh, coverage. Um, if there was a major drought and a full payout, uh, that would result in about six, four to six million dollars of averted humanitarian response costs. Four to six million dollars in averted humanitarian response costs. So for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in premiums that builds assets and helps people improve their food security, we potentially avert six million bucks worth of uh, humanitarian response costs. So, so we figure that's a pretty good deal. Because you're changing your your risk exposure. Yeah. Basically. Can I, can I just say one thing, because I, I thought that was a great answer. But, I, but you know, it, it really, <clears throat> people's ability, price is a huge issue on these things in terms of their ability to go to scale. Um, but it will vary depending on what kind of target population you're talking about, whether you're talking about more vulnerable populations and using this more as a safety net tool, or you're talking about more commercially oriented. And there's a, and there's a big, you know, it's a, it's a continuum in between. But what I think is going to be the most interesting thing to watch in some of the places where we really will see a push towards scale, places like Kenya, is the complementarity between efforts to use insurance as a safety net and the development of the market uh, for commercial products. Because I think there's, a, there's some inherent uh, market development, well, there's market development that will occur when they're used when these tools are used as a safety net product that will make them commercially available because it'll it'll incentivize the the um offering of these products by the by the uh insurance just just to, just to add there I mean, one of the the social protection function of insurance is a really <coughs> i think important um discussion and one of the things that we did in senegal uh, in our design on, on, on pricing is we did an analysis of the, um, essentially the cost to protect someone's food security and livelihood. Like how much money would you need to have paid out in a drought to protect basic food security and consumption and prevent negative uh, coping from occurring versus how much would you need to pay out to do that plus uh, make sure that you had a, a viable agricultural uh, season in the next season, you know, so you could buy rebuy seeds and tools and, 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 and other inputs. And, and obviously one's more expensive than, than the other. And since our focus was really on, on food security and social protection, and given the pricing difference, we chose that our base product would focus on, on protection and be cheaper. 
uh, than than a more commercial model as as well. And so that's um, that's the first time that I've ever seen you know an analysis to look at the cost and the options and and it gives you an interesting policy framework to think about how you you know how you spend your your development dollars as a government or or a donor to get and to get what impact and 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 where uh, where you try where to the calibrate this is. yeah the really instrument. Good. Um, so I'm going to group a couple of questions together again. Electra asks, could you, sorry, what, could you speak up yeah, a bit? I can't hear what ratio of weather station versus remote sensing do you use? And um, if remote sensing prevails, how do you deal with basic how do you risk? Deal with basis risk? Basis risk. Well, I was waiting for that question. Yeah. 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 And there's another somewhat similar one around data. So um, what are the data issues in deciding index to use? And how difficult is it convince farmers to pay for insurance, um, which is a new concept to most of them? What was the last part of that? Question? Uh, how difficult is it to convince farmers to pay for insurance? Because it's a new concept to them. Um, oh, I'll start with the data and yeah, uh, data and uh, basis risks. Okay. Um, okay, data um, remote sensing. Um, yeah. I mean, every place is a little different, so you really have to understand how how the climate works in a place and and how it relates to agriculture. And um, how it relates to the losses you're trying yeah, to protect against. Exactly, and and what's possible operationally. So it, normally, for for ag micro insurance, the a, a rule of thumb outside West Africa is that you need a weather station every 25 kilometers uh, in order to be able to have a decent correlation between precipitation. Uh, and loss. Uh, that depends on many factors, and there's still a great deal of basis risk in, 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 in weather stations. In other words, the risk that um, the um, measure of the index <clears throat> does not actually reflect the real loss. So you could see uh, a real drought and a real loss, and the weather station gets a lot of rain one day, um, so people don't get paid, uh, or vice versa, so that the rain, uh, the rain gauge shows uh, that there's uh, been a drought, but there hasn't really been a drought, and there's no loss. Um, so um, people get a payout despite having having no loss. So, so dealing with that is a major issue with weather stations and, and remote sensing. Uh, in West Africa, the spatial variability of rainfall means that you need a weather station at least every 10 kilometers, and even then, it's not that good. Uh, so weather stations tend, even if you have them, not to be great. So we've, in, in almost all of our products, relied on remotely sensed data. Um, we, and that's one of the reasons why the continuous improvement in the index is, is really important. And we use weather stations really to, um, to validate the remote sensing, to improve the quality of it, because most remotely sensed data is actually uh, a combination of station data and satellite data, so it's interpolated cold cloud cover rainfall data, normally if it's rainfall. Uh, so, um, and that's why the remote sensing question is really, is really uh, important. Um, with remotely sensed data, your basis risk is also a major, major issue because the resolution of the remotely sensed data is sometimes like 25 kilometer grids. So if you um, are in a place that has a hill, uh, or a mountain, the cloud comes over, it drops all the rain on one side and drops no rain on the other side. If your farm's on the side where it rains, you're pretty good. Uh, if your farm's on the other side, you're, you've got a drought. Uh, and the data in the, in the remotely sensed grid is averaged across. So dealing with that is a major issue. So we've done things like combined, uh, in Ethiopia this year, rainfall data and vegetation data. Uh, as a check, so you have two things working uh, in parallel to to try and make sure you get a better a better answer. Uh, we've started looking at things like double trigger uh, policies, and a number of colleagues uh, in in I4 projects have been testing that. So you use the remotely sensed data as a first trigger. So if it shows there's a drought, and you can make that a let's say a softer trigger and a bit more room for for error then you do something else, like you actually go and do a, a yield assessment or you use um, uh, yield data at the local level 
Um, so you, you as, a, as a backup, as a, audit, as a backup. Yeah. So just just to make sure that it really there really was a, a, a loss. Um, obviously, explaining the complications of that technically to a, a farmer is uh, is a challenge. Um, on the other hand, you know, for us, um, I mean, there's one lesson for for <laughs> from from this is that. Farmers are very, very good risk managers. <laughs> That's their day in, day out business. They know their seasons, they know their patterns. Uh, and when you do, um, when you engage from the beginning with farmers in the design process, you know, we have community uh, index insurance design teams that work with local farmers uh, to develop the products. You build the capacity, especially, you know, with, with, with the Kind of lead farmers in a in a community to understand the product over time. They're involved in fine tuning it each year, reviewing the the process each year, um, and so if you kind of apply what's good development practice, community engagement with insurance design, you get um, <clears throat> you get a better dialogue, um, and I think that's that's really important. Um, that said, as we as we scale up, you know you're going to reach millions of farmers then. Uh, financial education, product education has to be part of it. And there's lots of interesting experiences uh, there. For example, in, in Kenya, uh, there's a very interesting livestock uh, index insurance uh, program um, supported by, uh, by ILRI and, and, and USA. It started and, as an I4. Started as an I4 project. Uh, and there they have all kinds of things, uh, movies, cartoons, uh, plays at the community level where people act out uh, the insurance processes. I know this sounds an exciting play. I know I, I certainly would, would love to get um, But, but that, that kind of more creative uh, product education, I think, is a really, is a really interesting avenue. Uh, just, again, I'm so glad you're here. I don't have to, like, do it. You're much more you than I am on this. But I, but, I just want to add, so uh, so remotely sensed cloud cover uh, estimations of rainfall are just one type of satellite data that are being used. I mean, people are really, um, including your, your work uh, in Senegal, on that, the looking at different indices mm -hmm. and comparing them. Um, a lot of people are doing work to try to push the frontier on the types of indices that can be used. Um, and, and especially in the area of satellite data, so NDVI, I mean, that, that in the insurance that, that Richard just mentioned, the livestock insurance product in northern Kenya is actually an NDVI product. Um, people are working on evapotranspiration and, and other kinds of data. There's lots of data out there, um, satellite data, that can be used. Again, I want to underscore the importance of picking the right type of index, right? It's not that NDVI is better than rainfall. In some places it will be, in other places it won't be, right? So it really is about picking the right index for the right context. And um, th that means the topography, the, the soils, the, the crop. It's, it's really about testing out the index against the losses you're trying to protect against. And then the other thing is this, this idea of doing different different types of design, I think, is really critical. And, I, and in, in that area, I think we do have more work to do yeah. on, on uh, really innovating on design. All right. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time for today's seminar. I know there were a lot of questions left um, and really great conversation. So I want to thank uh, Richard and Lana for um, joining us today and answering. Um, they'll stick around a little more time in the room to hopefully talk to some of you. And for those online, we have your questions. So thank you. Um, just to let everyone know, we do have some upcoming events. Um, our next Microlink seminar is going to be on May 20th, May 19th, I'm, I apologize. And that is going to be on SME development and impact evaluation. So we hope to see you there. The next Ag Sector Council is going to be on May 20th, and that's on mycotoxins. And then we also have a special SEEP webinar on May 14th. This is going to be um, from Leo, and they're going to look at evidence review on wage labor. All of that's going to be available on the Microlink site and the AgriLink site as a web, um, 
ad, uh, advertised on those sites. So we look forward to uh, seeing you all at those events. So thank you again.